All right, it is noon. We are going to get going. Um, welcome, everyone, to our second installment of the Delirium Cohort. Um, Chris will be our speaker again, so thank you for joining us, Chris. Um, again, if you wouldn't mind putting your name and organization in the chat, that would be helpful. It just helps us better track who is joining us today. Um, this is being recorded, so we will put it on the website along with slides once um, we're all wrapped up. Um, don't remember, don't forget to mute your lines if you're not speaking, but we encourage you to unmute and join in the conversation if you um, are have something to, to ask or share or anything like that. Um, also, if, if your organization has not gotten me a gap analysis from the kind of prior to the work being done, if you wouldn't mind sending that to me um, yet this week, we're going to try and tally those up so that um, we can better gauge what we need to work on and what progress we've made um, from our work with this delirium cohort. So um, holler at me if you don't have that and I'll resend it or if you aren't the person that I have as a contact, it probably went to someone else in your organization. So shoot me an email if you don't have that gap analysis. It's very short, very simple to fill out. So if you could get us that, that would be helpful. Um, otherwise, I think I will turn it over to Chris so she can start the education and um, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, again, I'm Chris Venovich. I'm an adult geriatric clinical nurse specialist at Methodist Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, so here we are on our second cohort. So just, um, Quick recap, last session, we talked about formulating teams, delirium identification and tool selection. Um, now we're gonna move forward with like staff and family education, delirium risk factors, prevention, treatment, order sets and care plans. And actually I'm gonna turn my video off just because I don't wanna have any technical difficulties as we um, proceed through this. So just give me one second here. Okay, so I just want to get a pulse on where we're all at. Um, last time we talked about next steps or homework, if you will. So I just want to see um, if you guys would take a moment and put in the chat and let me know what you're working on right now. Are you still working on getting leadership support? Are you developing your team, selecting your target population, or um, working on selecting a tool? And if you're as far as working on selecting a tool, um, throw in the chat what tool that you've selected, just because I'm curious and I'd like to know, and, and the group might like to know. So I'll just give, give you all a moment to put that in there. I have done nothing. Okay, Valerie, your honesty is is beautiful. <laughs> this perfectly appropriate because this is all mm. education on where to go. So I'll just give it another second. Um, but also another question that I have um, is uh, just wondering um, for your organizations if practice is guided by nursing care plans provider order sets or a little bit of both and also if you could share with me what emr you're you're utilizing so it looks like we had a few more um in the chat so um oh i lost it here there we go um so Vera Creighton currently screens everyone over 65 using the new desk. Um, Valerie said they are, yes, they're gonna start the age-friendly journey. So gonna kind of start implementing alongside that. Um, Trish says not currently doing anything in the learning process. Um, 
It looks like Rita said they're going to use some uh, building from age friendly using the CAM ICU because that's what's in their EMR and they are using Cerner community work. Um, the ICU is using the CAM tool, Michelle said. Um, Avericrate uses Meditech Expanse. Uh, Brittany from Lexington said they're using the four A's and they have Cerner, but the CAMS is not available available in their community work solution. And Michelle George said they're using Epic. That Nebraska Great. slide. Great. Okay, that is helpful. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our objectives today. So we're going to identify steps necessary for successful implementation of a delirium program. Construct education for delirium programming. Identify patients at risk for delirium. Examine interventions to help prevent delirium. And discuss care of the patient with delirium. So again, I put this little age-friendly link up there if anybody needs um, the link for age-friendly. And the next step, I put a link for niche. So. If you're not a NICHA organization, NICHA is a nurse-driven program designed to help hospitals and healthcare organizations improve the care of older adults. It provides principles and tools to stimulate change in clinical practice in order to achieve patient-centered nursing care for older adults in healthcare facilities. Uh, one of the links I put up there, if you do have access to NICHA, is the clinical improvement model for delirium. It's a wonderful resource that will really guide um, a delirium program implementation. Um, and so the next is the implementation team. So last time we talked about the PDSA and getting our team together to kind of determine um, what your tool selection and implementation of the tool, but looking at implementation of the delirium program, um, your breakdown of the team, of course, you want hospital administration, um, all aspects of nursing at the table, directors, managers, educators. Um, you really want providers. So somebody, a provider for medicine, a, a surgeon would be helpful. If you have psychiatry, it's good to have them on board as well. Um, pharmacists, therapists, uh, for therapists, you'd want physical therapy, occupational therapy, and rec therapy. A research scientist, quality improvement specialist, and somebody from the supply chain. I really feel the supply chain is important because some of the delirium prevention interventions are items that you might need to bring into your organization if you don't already have them. So to have them at the table is very helpful. So responsibilities of the team. Um, one, you wanna determine staff's current knowledge in relation to delirium assessment, prevention, and treatment. Then determine staff's attitudes towards delirium. Um, identify gaps in current practice related to delirium prevention, assessment, treatment, and management uh, based on the evidence. And then design order sets or practice alerts, care plans uh, that assist the clinician to follow evidence-based guidelines. So also design information systems that support clinical practice and produce measurable outcomes. Uh, develop an education and or develop the education and an educational plan, as well as identify resources necessary to design, implement, and sustain the program. And then lastly, promote communication of delirium risk. So talking about barriers, resistance to change is a known barrier to implementation of any new initiative in an organization. And so to overcome these barriers, you truly need a team approach with each discipline aware of their own roles and all with the same focus of improving care for the patient and family. So to help overcome barriers, um, it's helpful for administration to acknowledge the status quo is no longer acceptable as your very first step. And then clearly state the organizational goal and expectation of the clinicians so lack of confidence in the assessment of delirium is common among nurses and providers, especially when a baseline cognitive impairment exists. So until ruled out, consider a change in mental status to be delirium and raise awareness among the care team and family members or other caregivers about the risk of delirium, um, particularly with those with dementia. 
And then we have competing agendas and time. Uh, this is always a barrier, but one way to break this barrier is to have clinical expert champions from your different disciplines available to teach, provide feedback and reinforce practice behaviors. If your champions are fellow nurses and providers, they can help staff understand and find purpose in the change, as well as learn tricks on how to incorporate the change into their daily practice, um, improve buy-in and enhance your program overall. And then lastly, align quality metrics with the organizational targets. Hospital acquired delirium can be considered an adverse nosocomial event and viewed as a quality indicator. So incorporate that. <clears throat> So procedures and protocols. For your program, it's helpful to create standardized documents that guide practice. The documents should be easily accessible for staff to utilize as a reference. And it's helpful to include documents that address delirium risk assessment, uh, prevention interventions, how and when to perform delirium screening, when and how to notify providers of abnormal delirium screenings or screens, uh, provider diagnosis of delirium and potential etiologies, um, how and when to educate families regarding delirium, delirium treatment management strategies, as well as ongoing care of patients with delirium and reassessment. And when it comes to education, when you're determining who to educate um, for a delirium program, everybody needs to be educated. Uh, nurses, nursing assistants, techs, therapists, providers, even um, families, caregivers, friends of the patient with delirium. <laughs> and when you're looking at what you should educate, um, well, first define delirium, educate how to recognize it, um, prevention and care of the patient, um, treatment, and then for when you educate, it's prior to implementation. And then you'll wanna do this ongoing um, upon hire and annually. So the American Geriatric Society Clinical Practice Guideline for Post-Operative Delirium in Older Adults has a strong recommendation stating that healthcare systems and hospitals should implement formal education programs with ongoing formal or informal refresher sessions for healthcare professionals on delirium in an at-risk older surgical adults to improve understanding of its epidemiology assessment, prevention, and treatment. So this ongoing education, it doesn't have to be your initial education that you keep repeating. You can modify it, um, educate on whatever parts of your program need reinforcement or whatever trends you identify that need to be addressed. But even in my own organization, we had, um, tons of education when we went live and I can already see little areas that need improvement. And so we will be re-educating -edu again here soon. So nursing education, um, it's helpful to use a combination of teaching strategies to engage the learner and enhance learning. Uh, so begin with um, setting out a standard message Start with risk assessment and screening. Once that's mastered, move to management and treatment. And then uh, the list of examples here, these are all from Niche. I thought these uh, were good examples for teaching strategies. So the first one is really classroom style with a reviewing the delirium screening tool with slides and a reference page. Uh, the second is to show a video of the delirious patient and have the audience do the scoring. I really think a combination of the first two is a great way of doing it so that you're presenting the tool, discussing how to use it, and then have them actually practice it. Uh, the third one up here is having educators and experts accompany bedside nurses and observe assessments and interactions with the patient. So they would jointly score the patient and discuss. This strategy requires the educator to familiarize themselves with the base, uh, patient's baseline information prior to observation. It is very resource intensive, but it's valuable. Um, the fourth on here is to integrate delirium screening into bedside report. I think this is incredibly valuable, especially early on. Um, if 
they're doing their uh, screening together during bedside report, any discrepancies between the nurse's verbal account and the translation of the tool can be reconciled and both nurses will benefit. If there's any question, they can defer their questions to the expert. Um, this is particularly good for new staff. And then the fifth one is the expert attends rounds, reviews records, and follows up with staff regarding discrepancies. Um, I really think the fifth one is a great way to hardwire practice. So if you are doing bedside rounds, I know in my organization on the ACE unit that I work on, um, I attend rounds. And part of our rounds, we ask the staff to um, state the patient's orientation, uh, if they have a history of dementia, and then their current delirium score. And then we start troubleshooting from rounds. Um, and then if I have questions in regards to how they're scoring, then it's easier to follow up on. So then uh, continuing with nursing education and delirium screening, there are certain parts of the education that may need more attention than others. Uh, for example, staff may make comments like, um, the patient doesn't have delirium, they're just a little confused, or they don't have delirium, they're just forgetful. Or um, I hear a lot, the patient's alert and oriented times four, they just say some off the wall stuff sometimes, or the patient doesn't have dementia, or the patient has dementia, so they don't have delirium. So all opportunities to provide more education when we hear statements like this. Um, for some reason, staff did not want to use the word delirium. They want to call it something else. Like they want to call it altered mental status or forgetfulness or the patient's just having um, a slow morning. So it's our job to get staff comfortable utilizing the word delirium. So let's not make excuses for delirium and just call it what it is and get staff comfortable with using that as well. Um, so on the screen, I have a screenshot of the new desk tool. Um, this is the tool that we utilize in my organization, not to say that it's better than any other tool. This is just what we utilize on MedSurge. So as I mentioned before with the forums rounds, uh, when staff make comments to me, like uh, the patients just forget, they're alert and oriented, they're just forgetful, they don't always know where they are, but then they remember and it's fine. Um, they don't have delirium. Or then they'll tell me that they have funny, um, funny off the wall stories that they're stating that don't make sense. So then I reroute them to the tool because a patient like that would actually score in positive. So, all staff, if not already doing so, should document mental status in the chart to measure changes from shift to shift. And then we wanna teach the staff to consider a change in mental status to be delirium until proven that it's not. And to further help with screening, um, have staff ask questions in a way that emphasizes the older adult's strengths. So I have a little screenshot of that UB2 on the screen. If you look, the very first question says, please tell me the day of the week. So we really wanna educate staff to ask the question in just that fashion, rather than asking, do you know what day it is today? Um, because most often um, or commonly seen is that the patient will say, yes, I know what day it is. Or yes, do you, or do you not know? And that's why you're asking me. So how we ask the questions is very helpful and important. So then we also wanna educate on delirium risk assessment. All patients should be assessed for delirium risk. You don't necessarily need a formal delirium risk assessment tool to proceed with your program, but staff do need to understand and be able to identify the patient's risk factors in order to determine who should have prevention measures in place. It's important for staff to understand that vulnerable, uh, for vulnerable patients, it may take only one insult to a precipitating factor to cause delirium. So for example, a delirium may develop after only one dose of a benzodiazepine in a patient who's severely ill or cognitively impaired. Whereas patients who are not vulnerable may require several insults to develop delirium. 
studies have shown that the effects of these risk factors may be cumulative and knowledge of the patient risk factors is helpful to incorporate into daily rounds. So I bring this slide up again. I mentioned it before, but I really like mind spaces um, or in any way that you can communicate to staff all the things that they should be looking at um, that are predisposing and precipitating risk factors for patients because if they have these, the likelihood of them developing a delirium is significantly higher. So then we wanna educate on non-pharmacological delirium prevention interventions. Um, the non-pharmacological interventions are really the most important interventions we can provide. So providing sensory devices to the patient, uh, we wanna ensure their glasses or hearing aids um, are with them or in use if they typically use them. If they forgot to bring them to the hospital, it's helpful if the hospital is able to provide like pocket talkers um, or magnifying sheets for use. I do have a picture of a pocket talker in there. I don't know if you have those in your organization, but I will tell you that so many patients that I see in the hospital, they have forgot their hearing aids or the hearing aid batteries are dead. Um, and or the hearing aids just don't work that well. So we have pocket talkers that we put covers over um, the headphones so that we can reuse them with different patients. And that really helps with their hearing. Um, also open and closing shades in the room for appropriate day and night lighting, uh, preserving the sleep wait cycle. So scheduling assessments to allow for uninterrupted sleep, encouraging frequent mobilization, uh, requesting fam family or friends to stay with the patient. Um, cognitive stimulation, like reminiscent activities are helpful. Um, encourage and assist patients with food and flu fluid intake. Avoiding Foley's and central line placements um, to decrease infection. Also just the addition of the lines tends to put patients more at risk for developing delirium. We want to provide the appropriate pain medication, and I recommend a pharmacy consult to review medications for potentially harmful medications. Um, so then just breaking it down, and you can use this information when you're educating staff, but when you're looking at prevention interventions for orientation, staff should know to always introduce themselves and their role each time they're going in the room, just in case they forgot. Uh, use calm, short, concise instructions and explanations. Um, always use the patient's name. It's good to talk about the weather, what's going on, the current events. Um, encourage families to bring in um, pictures, familiar objects. If they bring in pictures, it's great to hang them around the room. Um, validate the patient's feelings and perceptions. Always encourage family visits and phone calls. If you have iPads, it's really good to do FaceTime visits. And then engage in respectful communication. So it's good to teach staff to avoid simple language and baby talk. Older adults don't wanna be talked to in baby talk and they should avoid using terms like honey and sweetie. So then when it comes to sensory, um, it's really important to maintain uh, schedules and routines if able. We, we talked about um, the glasses and the hearing aids, so I won't go through that again. Um, provide age appropriate uh, television and radio options. Um, I, would, I wouldn't put cartoons on the TV unless the patient is actually asking for them. Uh, engage in meaningful conversation to stimulate memory and logic. Uh, talk about their children, um, how old children are, grandchildren, their jobs. Uh, and then offer diversional activities. So like word games, cards, magazines, uh, music, crossword puzzles. Uh, so the pictures that I have on this screen, uh, one is a tellurium prevention activity bag. So this is something that we utilize in our organization. If we have a patient that either has delirium or is at risk for developing delirium, 
we will offer them um, a delirium prevention bag that has little tactile objects to kind of play with and occupy their time. A lot of times there's decks of cards in there. Um, like you can see pictures of those balls, they're real tactile, so they can kind of play with them and squish them. Um, books. We do have occupational therapy round on our patients and recreational therapy. They are fantastic. Um, they will check in with the patients, see what activities they enjoy doing and try and provide those activities and then pet therapy. So if you're able in your organization to allow for, uh, patients to have their pets visit, that is incredibly helpful pr for preventing delirium. Um, even just being around pets is very helpful. So I know that we have some volunteers that have um, trained pets. And so the pets will come in and visit. Um, there's a, oh gosh, I forgot the name of the dog. Um, but we have a dog that comes in, his name is Dude. And, um, and when he hits the floor, the patients, when they see him in the hallway, will start yelling for him because they all, they all wanna play with Dude. But anyway, so individualized therapeutic activities have been shown to decrease agitation in hospitalized patients. So the more individualized we can get for our patients, the better off we are. So then looking at nutrition, so we can help prevent delirium by focusing on nutrition. Uh, nutritional deficiencies have, uh, have been shown to alter mentation. Restoring balance to these nutrients can potentially reduce the occurrence of delirium. So if you're not already doing it, you'd want to screen for malnutrition upon admission, uh, monitor food and fluid intake, monitor weight, um, really enforce fluid intake, um, and then optimize nutrition and hydration. If you have enhanced recovery uh, after surgery protocols, that's a great um, incorporating small amounts of nutritional supplements um, at a time is very helpful because it's less overwhelming to an older adult. Um, you can be creative. I have a note there that says Orange Julius. That is just a drink that we like to provide that is like Ensure orange juice, or excuse me, Ensure ice cream, orange juice. It's blended. We add a little Benna protein. So they have like at least 20 grams of protein in this drink. And it tastes like an orange Julius for them all. So patients tend to want to drink it rather than eating some of their, their foods. Um, we want to make sure that we're supplying dentures for meals, uh, assisting patients with feeding if they require assistance, and then providing companionship. Um, we can encourage family to sit with patients while they eat. Patients always eat more if somebody's around with around them. Um, and then mobility. So prolonged immobility is associated with a decline in muscle strength and mass, as well as physical and cognitive function. Delirium is often caused by immobility. So to help prevent delirium, implement early progressive mobility protocols in your organization. So you'd want to evaluate the readiness for mobility or avoid restraints and have a goal of getting the patient up to the chair for all meals. So physical therapy and occupational therapy is always very helpful in mobility. Um, your goal should be to mobilize three to four times a day, starting at whatever the patient's ability is. Obviously, these ladies on the screen are highly mobile, but if they weren't that mobile, I would start off with range of motion and then muscle strengthening, sitting, standing, transferring, and walking. And then sleep promotion. So maintaining healthy sleep patterns are so important in preventing delirium. Um, I mentioned appropriate day night lighting, particularly um, at night, dim the overhead lighting. I pay attention to this in your ICUs as well. I think um, ICU is a hard place to remember that you still need to focus on day night lighting because we tend to turn the lights on even when, uh, when patients are intubated, thinking that they don't know uh, the difference between day and night, but having the appropriate lighting will help prevent delirium even in that population. So minimize noise during sleep hours. Um, we want to limit screen time. So turn off computers, TV, radio, smartphones, and all other electronics for at least one hour 
prior to the intended bedtime, um, evaluate and limit hypnotic use, look at uh, daytime napping. Are they napping too long um, that they're not sleeping well at night? Um, and then evaluate the frequency of vital signs overnight. So I know in um, my organization on some of the units, they were able to implement what they call a right to a good night. And that is driven by a provider order, but it just allows nurses to skip one set of vital signs at night if it's appropriate for the patient so that they can quietly check on the patient to ensure safety but that they're not waking them up to do vital signs, that they have at least a six or eight hour period that they can get by without it. Now that doesn't work for all patients, but some we've been able to implement that and it is helpful. Um, when it comes to blood work, I don't know how blood work is in your organization, but here lab starts at 4 a.m. So if you can push lab off till 6 a.m., 7 a.m., depending upon the patient, that will help. And then look at non-pharmacological measures for um, encouraging sleep. So like relaxing music, massage, back massages, um, you know, just putting lotion on, limiting caffeine intake, or if they are going to have caffeine, let's make sure it's in the early hours of the day instead of the late ones. Uh, warm drinks at bedtime, toileting before bedtime, grouping cares, and then offering sleep masks and earplugs. Uh, if you stock on your units, uh, like a, a sleep aid bag, that you could include sleep masks, earplugs, and then um, some aromatherapy to help with sleep. That is uh, valued by a lot of patients. Okay, so next up here, uh, I have a link to the American Geriatric Society co-care help site. So AGS now owns HELP and HELP is the hospital elder life program. So HELP programs are designed to prevent delirium and functional de decline by utilizing volunteers to assist nursing staff with um, companionship for the patient, mobilization, uh, therapeutic and recreational activities, and um, they can really help improve nutritional intake and hydration. So this website here um, provides program, like help program implementation toolkit, as well as delirium screening tips and tricks. It also includes delirium education for patients and staff. And all resources are free to its members. I don't think it's very costly to be a member, um, but if you're not a member and you're not interested in it, there are some free resources through this website. Um, I will tell you, we have a help program in this organization. It's one of my favorite things. Um, our volunteers that participate with the help program, um, most of them are college students. Um, in different healthcare, like pursuing different healthcare fields, wanting to get volunteer hours, wanting to um, learn how to have good communication with patients. Um, some people are just uh, volunteers wanting to help out in the hospital. And then we even have retired RNs and providers. Uh, and those are some of my favorite volunteers. But I will tell you, having help volunteers um, provide delirium prevention interventions to patients can greatly reduce the incidence of delirium in your organization, as well as save your staff time. I, I can't even tell you how much time they save. It's wonderful. Um, and then family and caregiver education. So this is really important. Um, involving families in the identification of delirium and management of behaviors has been associated with improved outcomes. So we'd wanna educate the families and caregivers on the signs and symptoms of delirium and then enlist their support to alert the care team if they notice any changes. Um, it's good to utilize them to establish baseline, um, have them share with the care team if their loved one doesn't, seem like themselves. Um, I do have two links on the screen here. Uh, this is patient caregiver education and it's through the American Geriatric Society Health and Aging Foundation. Uh, these are great resources. These are both free. So um, 
when I I'll send this out and share it. But if you click on the links, there's um, managing delirium in older adults. That's great education for family and caregivers. And then there's ask the expert prevention and treatment of post-operative delirium. That's very helpful. Uh, the screenshot I have on here is just a little card that my organization will hand out to families when we give a delirium prevention bag. And it's real basic. It just tells them what delirium is, what it looks like, and what they can do to help. Because families just, they really want to know what they can do to help. Because seeing delirium occur is very scary for them. So then um, staff education on delirium screening and what to do when it's positive. So our now what? So a positive delirium screen warrants notification to the provider. So when calling providers, staff should be prepared to provide an SBAR. Um, and in the SBAR, they'd want to include the reason for admission, particularly if it's an on-call provider, just to establish a baseline there. Any significant past medical history, current vital signs, uh, medication changes in the last 24 hours, because medications, um, 40% of the time are the reason a patient develops delirium. Um, and then delirium score and what caused it. So staff should include delirium scores in their shift to shift report and closely monitor for changes in patient status as well. So then when it comes to treatment, um, providers need to take a detailed history to establish the patient's baseline. And then we need to rule out the potential reversible causes. So I like this acronym for delirium, and this is all of our reversible causes of delirium. So we've identified it, and now we're going to figure out what caused it. So with D for drugs, that includes any new medications, um, increased dosages of medications, drug interactions, um, and includes over-the-counter drugs, as well as alcohol. And then E for electrolyte disturbances, uh, especially in regards to dehydration and thyroid problems. And then L, low oxygen and lack of drugs. So we've got hypoxia that could definitely cause delirium. And then lack of drugs uh, is often specific to long-term sedatives, um, which would include alcohol and sleeping pills. So if they're suddenly stopped, then you can see delirium or you see it for lack of drugs when pain is not adequately treated and pain medications are not given. I've seen the pendulum swing where we treat pain, but we treat it at too high of doses and then a patient develops delirium. So then they remove all of the pain medication and then we've worsened delirium because now we're not treating pain. Um, I for infection, so commonly urinary or respiratory tract infections, um, R for reduced sensory input, which happens with vision or hearing. Um, and then I, I, again, for intracranial, such as infection within the brain or hemorrhage, stroke, uh, perhaps a tumor, although tumors aren't very common. Um, and then you, so we've clumped urinary tension and fecal impaction. So uh, evaluating constipation and the patient's ability to urinate. And then M, there's a lot of features for M. So myocardial, <laughs> metabolic problems and medications. So your my myocardial or pulmonary problems could include ar arrhythmia, worsening heart failure, COPD, uh, medications. Again, nearly 40% of delirium cases are caused by medications. So we want to evaluate that. So then in that box to the right of the screen, it's uh, when we're establishing the baseline and then ruling out causes. If you're looking at developing order sets, um, here's some lab tests that you could include on it. The urinalysis, thyroid function tests, um, checking a B12 level, level, tox screens, cortisol level, ABGs. I added a COVID-19 PCR on here. So delirium is the sixth most common presenting sign and symptom of COVID-19. And um, so I, I recently updated some order sets to include COVID-19 now, because it, it's just part of life. Um, lactate and glucose. 
And then for diagnostics, looking at chest x-rays, CTs, um, telemetry. And again, just because somebody has delirium doesn't mean we need to order all of these things. We just order what we find would be most appropriate. And then I showed this slide before, but I really like it because first up, we have delirium prevention. That's our multi-component team-based non-pharmacological interventions. But then once our patient um, has delirium, we're gonna evaluate and treat the underlying cause. And then we're still going to utilize the multi-component team-based non-pharmacological interventions. Uh, if the patient has distressing psychotic symptoms or agitated behaviors um, with a risk of, health, um, of harm to self or others, we wanna look at non-pharmacological strategies to inhibit that. And if those do not work, that's when we go to our second line, um, utilization of an antipsychotic, the lowest effective dose for the shortest duration needed with a tapering plan. So I'm gonna review medications real quick. Um, it's important to know that medications do not shorten duration of delirium. Uh, it would be nice if we could provide a medication or if there was a magic medication to go, make it go away, but there just is not. Uh, we want to avoid benzodiazepines. Uh, benzos are not recommended for the treatment of delirium because of their tendency to cause over sedation and to exacerbate the confusional state. They do, however, remain the drug of choice for the treatment of withdrawal of alcohol and sedatives. We can still use them in comfort cares or hospice, but for treatment of general delirium, avoid benzos. Uh, Antipsychotics are not FDA approved for the treatment of delirium. In fact, there's a big black box warning on them. So if we're going to use that, it should be only for severe agitation that will pose safety risks like hallucinations or dangerous behavior. Um, just remember a positive delirium score does not mean that you need to order medications. There's lots of things we should do prior to that. And any drug given should be at the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. So then a little bit about delirium order sets. Um, these are helpful to help to aid providers in screening for treatable exacerbating factors. Um, again, you can include labs, diagnostics. You can include the non-pharmacological interventions. Um, if your order set then fires tasks to nurses, that's wonderful. You can add consults for your different therapies and pharmacy. Um, again, pharmacy is really important for those potentially harmful medications and meta interactions. And then care plans. So originally I asked about um, in your organizations, do you guys use order sets or do you use care plans? Everybody is so different. You know, with my organization, we used to build a whole bunch of interventions and care plans but we found that the nurses weren't initiating them. So now we kind of bury them in order sets and then they're more likely to get initiated. So this screenshot that's on here, this is a view from Cerner. This is just what I have just to give you um, a guide of what a, a possibility or what it could look like. But this little uh, screenshot here, and I don't know if you can see my cursor because I don't know if it goes through here. I don't, um, doesn't look like it, but. Uh, so this is what the new desk looks like in my version of Cerner. You can see how it's documented. It gives um, a delirium score of a two, which is a positive screen. So then um, the nurse implemented the confusion acute or delirium risk for or present care plan, which has an outcome measure of delirium. And um, because Cerner is can be a little bit magical in the background. When staff document, it can pull through to care plans. So it can auto satisfy a care plan. So if you see underneath it, it says new desk score less than or equal to one. Um, and there's a big red X because the new desk score was a two, which is a positive. So then staff would know that they're not meeting that measure. And then they have to document a reason and an action. So under the outcome variance, you see this reason is this patient had 
pain because they're a post-op day one total hip that was immobilized for greater than 24 hours. And the nursing action is that they're going to treat the pain and they're going to do range of motion exercises and transfer patients to the chair. Um, so care plans, goals, these are very helpful. We do have other examples. I believe um, Age Friendly offers other examples of care plans, um, goals, and order sets. And then um, real quick, the complications of delirium. So all of our discussions here are all in an effort to avoid the complications of delirium. Um, and the most common ones that we see are malnutrition, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, um, aspiration pneumonia, pressure injuries, weakness um, from decreased mobility, um, falls and then combative behavior that leads to injuries and fractures, and then patients wandering and getting lost. So we'll do a summary here. Um, delirium prevention and treatment, it's everyone's responsibility. It takes a team. Delirium has an underlying cause and it's preventable and treatable in most cases. Care teams need to remove or treat the underlying cause if it occurs, restore or maintain function and mobility, understand delirium behaviors, uh, prevent delirium complications, and as always, have good communication between staff providers and interdisciplinary teams. So now many of you are still working on the, first, the next steps from our first cohort, and that's totally fine. Um, but just things to be thinking about or homework um, is developing our implementation team, uh, creating documents to guide practice. Um, one, how we're gonna educate staff, creating the education, and then the implementation of the delirium screening tool. So the next time we meet, um, we'll review quality metrics, process improvement, um, engaging patients and families, and sustainability. So what questions do you have? Do you get, please, uh, I'm, I'm definitely open for questions. This is Amber. I think that uh, one of the barriers that smaller hospitals in Nebraska have is that their EMRs, and I see some comments related to that. Um, do you have any experience with the Cerner Community Works? Um, I know a lot of facilities use that, but uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on that and, and how to overcome that barrier. Um, I will be really honest. I am not familiar with um, with the Cerner Community Works, uh, but I could certainly look into it and get back to you on that. Great, I think that'd be helpful. There's a question in the chat about um, education to providers. Um, little bit of non-believers maybe. What are your thoughts on provider education, Chris? Oh gosh, it's very important. It is really, really important. Um, so I would recommend getting a provider champion and that champion um, educating the fellow providers. It's really hard for nurses to edu educate providers um, because a lot of them really just aren't receptive to that. Uh, but you can certainly help create the education for whatever provider is going to share it. Um, so whoever your physician champion is, um, I would have them include some of the topics that we talked about. Um, if anybody needs some provider education, I do have some and would happily share it. But, um, they would want to talk to the providers about um, why we're screening, the tool we're using for screening, and when they're going to get notified, especially if they're going to get calls at night about it, and then what they can do about it. So if you are able to build an order set um, in your system, or at least give them, educate them on a guideline of 
what to start with, uh, it would be helpful. Um, there, there will be resistance initially, but that's why we keep doing the ongoing education. And as long as that champion keeps supporting the project, it, it will be helpful. I will tell you, we still have issues with providers here and there as well. And there's one one more note in there, just a uh, agreement that providers can make things a little bit difficult to implement. Yeah. Yeah, I see that in the chat about wanting to throw medications. Uh, they do. They really do. Um, and I I see that also um, in regards to Ativan. I think it's an it's old school that um, that they provide out of van and also from a nursing perspective when we see a patient struggling as nurses we want to help the patient so nurses will call providers at night and ask them like what do we do to help and um, and often nurses don't want to hear like well you're going to have to sit with the patient or keep them occupied because it all comes back to time. So then we look at what is easiest and what's easiest is to throw a medication. Um, the providers just aren't looking at the long-term effects of Ativan because when they throw Ativan at the patient, it doesn't make the problem go away. It just elongates it and then makes the problem worse. And now the patient is drowsy and even more at risk for falls and other complications. But yeah, I, I understand that barrier. Um, and, and it's so easy to, to try and give a medication, but they just have to learn over time that a medication won't help. Um, I'm looking for it here on my desk as I'm, I'm fiddling around and you guys can't see me fiddling around, but um, I have this in my reference page. There is a wonderful chapter and this is in um, a medical book now and it's from 2020, but it's titled Delirium in the Older Patient and Dr. Sharon Inoue wrote this chapter. So any med student that has this book would then be taught this chapter 25. This goes over everything that we just talked about. And it also goes over um, when and how to order medications and then has an algorithm for treating delirium for providers. So um, I would get a hold of this article and share it with your providers and your non-believers, because if they won't believe us, maybe they'll believe Dr. Anyway. And then I see the comment about the folding washcloths. That's a great practice. There's a reason that you had that practice and that's because it worked. So, if it's okay to have patients up at the nurse's station, I say do it. And if you have a plethora of washcloths, I'd give it to them. We still utilize that practice. It keeps their hands busy. And then All I right, see a couple. Anybody else have questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I see a comment saying having ready to go activity carts, uh, concierge of sorts. That's great. Um, activity boxes, activity bags, anything to occupy time is helpful. Awesome. Any other thoughts or questions and yes i will send out slides i'll actually send out i have the ones from last time too so i will send those out as well as we'll put the recording in the slides on the nha website so that will all be available 
for you guys. All right. Well, hearing none, we will wrap up. Um, reminder again that if you haven't done the pre-gap analysis, if you wouldn't mind doing that and getting it to me, um, we really kind of want to know where we started and then hopefully we can make some progress and get some things implemented for those of you that are kind of in the beginner stages or, or if you already have a program, if you've updated or changed, that's good information for us to know and just make sure that we're um, helping you reach your goals in those aspects. So um, otherwise, I think we're done. And you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.